Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar to launch the International Energy Agency's new Energy Efficiency 2024 report. Uh, we, we see uh, people are still coming into the Zoom, so just uh, allowing a little bit of time to, for everyone to uh, to get into the Zoom, and then we'll 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 kick things off. Uh, I'm guessing guessing we're getting near quorum, so perhaps we'll we'll get things going. As I said. Um, a very warm welcome to the launch of the International Energy Agency's new Energy Efficiency 2024 report. I'm Jethro Mullen, the head of the IEA's communications team, and I'm joined today by Dr. Brian Motherway, the head of the Energy Efficiency and Inclusive Transitions Office, and by the lead authors of the report, uh, Lucas Berla and Emma Mooney. So today's, uh, during today's event, uh, Brian's going to make some opening remarks, and then Lucas and Emma will present the key findings of the report. Uh, and then we'll take some questions from from you, uh, the participants. Um, and so uh, in that sense, uh, you, the participants, we invite you to send your questions via the Q&A function uh, in the Zoom. Uh, you can do this at any point uh, during the presentation. Uh, and we'll also take a, a quick two minute break after the presentation for you to enter your questions. And so with that, I'll pass the floor to uh, Brian Motherway. Thank you very much, Jethro, and uh, let me add my warm welcome to everybody joining us for today's launch of the 2024 Energy Efficiency Market Report. Energy efficiency, we see a growing awareness of its importance. We see a growing appreciation of its function as a job creator, as a buttress to energy security and resilience, and a key support to energy affordability. And of course, we see growing awareness of its centrality to meeting our climate and clean energy goals. This growing awareness is leading to higher levels of ambition. So exactly one year ago at COP28 in Dubai, we saw a historic moment where countries around the world committed to working together to aim for doubling energy efficiency progress by 2030. So one year on and on the eve of COP29, what are we seeing on the ground? Are we seeing this pathway from awareness to ambition become a pathway from ambition to action? Well, this year's market report will explore that in detail, uh, and you will see that we are seeing a degree of policy response. In fact, just this year in 2024, uh, countries representing over 70% of the global economy have either put in place new energy efficiency policies or strengthen existing energy efficiency policies. There are many excellent examples that you can read in the report, and you'll hear some of them this morning. But having said that, you'll also see that we're not seeing this level of policy response yet turning into real stronger energy efficiency progress on the ground. Now, maybe you wouldn't expect that just a year since, since the agreement, but on the other hand, it's only five years to 2030. So we do need to see a strengthening of that action and implementation if we are to meet our goals and if we are to reap the benefits that energy efficiency offers us. So you will see in this morning's presentations, two themes really run through this year's energy efficiency market report. First of all, energy efficiency at the end of the day is always about people. It's about making energy more accessible and affordable. It's about allowing people to benefit from heat or cooling or mobility. It's about allowing businesses to be competitive uh, and to be efficient. And it's allowing people to have that energy and its benefits in an, in an accessible, but also in a sustainable way in terms of its environmental impacts. The second theme you'll see is policy matters. When good policies are put in place and well implemented, then we see the energy efficiency benefits. And that's really the lesson that if on this pathway from awareness to ambition to action, action matters, policy design, policy enactment, and policy implementation. So let me hand over now to the lead author of this year's Energy Efficiency Market Report, my colleague, Lucas Burley. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, hi, everyone. And thank you to the entire team of colleagues that contributed to the report which hopefully gives you all some nice new insights into energy efficiency trends in 2024. Now that we have some context about the big picture, let's dive into the numbers. To measure global energy efficiency progress here at the IEA, we look at the change in the energy intensity of the global economy. If the amount of energy used to create the same economic outputs decreases, the world is becoming more efficient. Energy intensity change is driven by two factors. GDP or economic growth on the one hand, and energy demand on the other. So to be better understand some of the trends in energy efficiency globally this year, 
it's therefore useful to first turn our attention to energy demand. After several external shocks that we've seen in the past few years, first of all, driven by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021, and then the global energy crisis in 22 and 23, we see last year that energy demand grew by around 1.7%. Specifically driven, we saw a recovery in industrial energy demand. This year, our estimates for 2024, and they are estimates as the year hasn't ended yet, we expect energy demand globally to grow by around 2%. This is again driven by growth in industry demand, but also increased cooling demand, dri driving up electricity demand in different regions. Energy demand is influenced by different factors. On the one hand, you have structural and activity effects pushing demand upwards. You can think about more people getting access to energy, but also people using more energy. For example, in advanced economies, in particularly driving bigger vehicles or living in bigger homes. And on the other hand, you have efficiency trying to temper some of this demand growth. The balance between these two forces determines overall demand growth and is an important determinant in global energy efficiency progress. One area where we can see some of these forces at play this year is the increased demand for cooling and its corresponding effects on electricity demand. We have analyzed the effort, uh, the electricity demand for different temperature levels. And what we can see is that peaks are higher at higher temperature levels because this is when air conditioners have to work the hardest and are most often turned on. In the past few years, we see that these peaks have shifted upwards. So the peaks are getting steeper and higher, especially at high temperatures. Driving this is an increased demand for cooling. Last year saw the hottest year on record, but this year is already on track to beat that. Many countries have experienced new heat waves and extreme temperatures of sometimes up to 50 degrees Celsius, which has driven the demand for much needed and sometimes life-saving cooling technologies, such as air conditioners. As a result, sales of air conditioners have increased in many places in 2024, which has pushed up electricity demand. As a result, many countries have seen peak electricity demand records in 2024, and sometimes even blackouts and power outages. So this increase in demand is putting severe strain on electricity grids globally. However, many air conditioners sold today are not the most efficient models yet. Improving the efficiency levels of air conditioners can mitigate some of these upward shifts in energy demand. Another important driver in global efficiency progress is how much money is flowing to efficiency, the level of investment. This includes businesses purchasing more efficient motors or governments spending on efficiency subsidies. But most investments in efficiency come directly from people at home, investing in renovations of their house, buying an efficient heat pump, or switching to more efficient devices. After seeing significant growth from 2019 to 2022 in efficiency investment, investment since 2020 has remained relatively flat. And in 2024, we also expect to see a relatively weak growth in efficiency investments. An interesting development in 2024 is that some emerging markets, in particular in Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America, are expected to see some of the fastest growth in 2024. However, that's unlikely to shift the global total as these markets still represent less than 5% of total global efficiency investment. As with most clean energy investments, efficiency investments are still heavily concentrated in North America, China, and Europe. Now that we've seen some of the factors affecting efficiency progress globally, it's time to see how these have all come together to shape energy efficiency progress in 2024. And this year, our analysis shows that global progress in energy efficiency is expected to be slow in 2024, around 1%. This is similar to last year and significantly lower than the required rate in the COP28 target to double energy efficiency progress by 2030. As a result, the world is currently not yet on track to achieve its ambition with regards to energy efficiency, and the ambition has not turned into action yet. However, in the past decade, many countries have managed to reach higher levels of efficiency improvements, with, for example, 9 out of 10 countries achieving a rate of 4% at least once in the past decade. So it is possible, but policy implementation needs to ramp up if we want to reach those levels again and sustain them. 
The picture here shows the global picture, but in parallel today with the launch of the report, we have also launched a new energy efficiency progress tracker where you can dive into many more details for different regions or different indicators of energy efficiency progress. So would highly recommend you all to check that out for free on the IEA website. Now that we've seen some of the global ambition and where recent progress has brought us, it's good to remind ourselves of what's at stake. What would the world get from accelerating the shift from ambition to action? First of all, energy efficiency is crucial for the transition away from fossil fuels. For example, in the IEA COP28 full implementation case, which assumes the COP28 energy goals are achieved in full and on time, global oil demand could be reduced by almost 24 million barrels per day by 2030, compared to the IEA state of policy scenario, which assumed current policy settings. To put that into perspective, global oil demand was around 100 million barrels per day last year. Two, -thir two thirds of the potential reduction is driven by measures related to the doubling of energy efficiency improvements, such as technical efficiency measures or electrification. Many countries already have strong policies in place today or have introduced new policies in 2024 to accelerate the transition away from oil. For example, Canada has a program in place that allows low-income households to replace their oil heating systems for efficient heat pumps. And India just very recently announced a major new policy update to promote electric vehicles such as electric scooters, rickshaws, and electric buses. Secondly, energy efficiency is crucial for affordability. This topic has been put to the top of many policy agendas in recent years, driven by the high prices during the energy crisis. And our analysis shows that efficiency is indeed one of the best ways to structurally lower energy bills and increase access to affordable energy services. Not only are many efficient technologies already cost competitive with inefficient models, so you can buy them for roughly the same price, but efficient models are even significantly cheaper over their entire lifetime because of their lower energy use. This is true for uh, refrigerators in Ghana, as we show on the slide here, but in the report, we also analyze other technologies such as air conditioners, heat pumps, and electric vehicles in a number of regions, including Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Policy is again the main way to promote efficient products. And many countries have strong policies in place or updated them this year. For example, Singapore this year in April introduced a policy to give households more than $200 for the purchase of efficient household appliances such as fans, LED lighting, or water heaters. Third, energy efficiency can lead to many more jobs. As of today, 10 million people are already employed in efficiency-related jobs. But that growth in efficiency jobs has sort of stagnated in recent years since 2019. There are also big regional differences with most of the jobs located in China, Europe, and North America. However, if the world would accelerate energy efficiency progress, this could mean up to 4 million additional jobs in energy efficiency by 2030. You can think about construction workers working to build or renovate efficient homes, heat pump installers, but also manufacturers of efficient appliances or electric vehicles. This does require, however, a strong policy approach. Many countries are currently experiencing labor shortages for skilled energy efficiency workers, with, for example, four out of five construction companies just last year indicating a shortage of skilled workers. Policy can address this issue, but governments need to work together with the private sector, labor unions, and education institutions to train and reskill workers to scale up the energy efficient workforce. With that, I'll now hand over to my colleague, Kim Amun. Thank you, Lucas. So we've heard how strong energy efficiency policies are essential to deliver our climate goals and to move from the ambition to action. At global, regional, and national level, swift policy action is needed to reach our, our target to double progress on energy efficiency, and we know it can be done. As mentioned, most countries have already reached the level of 4% at least once since 2019, and there's opportunity and potential to do it again. But how can we do it? Well, at the IEA, we track not only the energy intensity progress, but we also track the energy efficiency policy progress, where the policies are in place, what the policies cover, and what proportion of the energy consumption is covered. Through tracking this, we have seen the progress in energy efficiency that is due to policy action. With coverage of policies increasing across all sectors and regions. In the last 10 years, 
33 countries have newly introduced minimum energy performance standards called METs, while in 2024 alone, 13 countries have updated their METs. Throughout the report that we're launching today, we highlight examples of where energy efficiency policies are accelerating, pro accelerating progress through increased coverage. This can be through long running programs or through newer policies, as in some of the key policy 2024 updates. Some of them include the Southern African Development Community, a grouping of 16 individual countries that have introduced harmonized regional standards for air conditioners and refrigerators, reducing energy bills for consumers while saving up to 6.5 million tonnes of CO2 emissions by 2040. Or the new standards for vehicles in Chile and Australia that are targeting the performance and emissions from a mix of vehicle types, including trucks and commercial vehicles. New policies in India and South Africa are targeting industrial motors to eliminate the most inefficient models from the market. In India, the policy approach is through motor replacement, while South Africa is increasing MEPs for new motors. These compelling examples, of which there are many more in the report, demonstrate the potential to increase the coverage across all sectors and regions, and highlight the many varied opportunities for policymakers to leverage. So while increasing policy coverage plays an important role in achieving our energy and climate goals, strengthening and increasing the quality of the policies is also a vital tool in moving quickly from ambition to action. Where policies are already in place, there is substantial opportunity to increase efficiency, to reflect the most efficient levels achievable through regular updating of standards. Strengthening stringency leads to a continual enhancement of the efficiency standards. And this leads to an increase in performance of the efficiency performance of buildings, appliances, and technologies for consumers. An example of where both coverage and stringency could drive up energy efficiency is in the residential building sector. Our analysis shows that only half, globally, only half of all new residential builds have mandatory building energy performance codes. There is clearly an opportunity to increase coverage through more countries introducing codes. But additionally, across all climate zones, we see there is a wide range in the energy demand of the compliant buildings, depending on the stringency codes of the, in place in that country. This means that depending on the strength of the codes, an equivalent home can use three to four times more energy in one country than another, while still complying to the relevant code. So in all cases, there are opportunities for homes to be built at standards that use substantially less energy than those that just comp comply with existing energy codes and therefore widespread potential to further increase stringency, thus driving down the energy use of buildings, reducing emissions, and really importantly, increasing both the affordability and the comfort for households. Across many sectors and technologies, we see that when minimum energy performance standards are increased, there is a resultant increase in energy efficiency, as was demonstrated by Lucas in the case of refrigerators in Ghana earlier, but also through the many other excellent examples of policy strengthening that we see in our 2024 report. Again, so a few examples. In the United States, they have issued updated fuel economy standards for passenger cars. China has a plan that includes a target to improve national energy intensity by 2.5% for 2024, with a focus on large industry networks, or in large industries, sorry. And Kenya has replaced an outdated 1968 policy with new building energy codes. While in the EU, there is a policy, the policy objective is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 60% in the building sector by 2030 when compared to 2015. These examples show what can be achieved and highlight that in our move from ambition to action, we need policies to be implemented quickly across all sectors and all regions. At the IEA, we are working on this and we've produced a number of products to support policymakers, including the very successful training weeks in emerging uh, economies on energy efficiency policy, and the IEA Policy Toolkit. Our toolkit has been developed to provide practical advice for policy implementation. We know that policies are strongest when they include regulation, information, and incentive. And we know that they're strongest when they are designed with people at the center. The toolkit combines these levers with cross-cutting elements, such as increasing resources, capacity building, and skills development, and, and uh, assessment and updates. The IEA is continuing to develop these products further through, for example, our new initiative called the Efficiency Implementation Drive, where we are working directly with policymakers 
on their policy development and design to accelerate the steps from policy ambition to energy efficiency action. And with this, I'll hand back to Brian. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Lucas. So colleagues, you've seen the benefits of energy efficiency and the positive impacts of strong action. And we see many really excellent examples of this strong action and all of these are to be found in this year's market report. But we also see that the numbers are not where they need to be. And in order to support governments and stakeholders really understand this and, and take the appropriate action, we're pleased today to launch our new energy efficiency progress tracker, which is available right now online and allows you to probe in detail energy efficiency and demand trends right around the world to understand what is going on and what needs to be done. We've also seen in the market report that um, there are solutions available. And this year's report really focuses on what those solutions are, what impacts are having, and what else is needed by governments and stakeholders around the world. The report is available right now online and it's free to download. And as well, you can also find some special sections such as regional focus chapters, looking at regions such as Latin America and Africa in more detail, a range of in-depth spotlights on key topics ranging from heat pumps and air conditioners to energy efficiency investment, and the report also contains recommendations for early action, learning from what's working right around the world, what can governments do right now in terms of policy action and implementation to accelerate progress. And in the same vein, the IEA is stepping up through its new efficiency implementation drive, working directly with governments hands on to enact and implement stronger policies and to drive that narrative from awareness to ambition to action. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back now to Jessa. Thank you, Jessa. Thank you very much, Brian, um, for those remarks and to Lucas and Emma for the, for the excellent presentation. Um, and we now have a, uh, a chance to take some questions from, uh, from all of you who are joining us uh, here for the webinar. So um, we invite you to send the questions through the Q&A function in the Zoom, uh, if you haven't done so already. Uh, and uh, we'll just take a quick two minute break uh, to give you a chance to send in your questions and we'll be right back. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. And thank you very much for the questions uh, that are flowing in. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as we can uh, in the time we have. Uh, so um, maybe we'll do them in we'll do them maybe two at a time. Um, uh, first of all, we have one that says, when we say building, uh, does that mean the residential or the domestic energy demand? Uh, and then also uh, a demand related question, very interesting graph about uh, peak demand versus temperature in India. Did you see the same for summer peak demand in European countries? Um, and that question is from Jean-Sébastien Jean Brock of, uh, of IEECP. So perhaps uh, Emma, you could clarify on what we mean uh, when we say buildings and uh, Lucas, uh, you could talk a little bit about uh, the seasonal demand in Europe? Thank you for the questions. So first of all, um, there is more information within the market report and I'd advise you to go and look at our market report which was launched today so that you can see exactly the answers to those questions. But in response to when we say building, do we mean residential or domestic energy demand? The IEA as tracks and analyzes, analyzes building codes from both residential and non-residential sectors. So when we say building energy codes, we mean the building sector as a whole, unless we specify exactly the focus of what those building, um, certain buildings are. Uh, I think that should clarify to note to you, Lucas. Thank you, Emma. And thank you for the, for the excellent question on peak demand versus temperature. Um, in the presentation, we showed this for India, but in the report, you can find a similar analysis for Brazil and Turkey, for example where cooling has a clear impact on rising uh, electricity demand, peak electricity demand, due to higher ownership of over air conditioners and then higher temperatures. In Europe, the question was about Europe, um, we see this effect a little bit less as uh, the summers are generally a little bit milder at the moment and air conditioner ownership is slightly lower still. It is noticeable, however, in uh, southern European countries, Mediterranean countries such as Spain, Italy, or Crete, or Greece, and the south of France, where these temperatures are rising. So, um, in the report, you can find more analysis. And uh, I'll hand back to Jessica. Thank you both very much. Um, and so, working through the questions as they're coming in, uh, we have one on uh, the 
the impact of policies. So um, the question goes, in his introduction, Brian mentioned that you could see policy effects in countries having stronger policies. Uh, Emma also showed the importance of policies. However, the paper by uh, Stechmesser uh, et al. published in Science some months ago found that very few climate change mitigation policies had a significant impact. Uh, is the difference in their conclusion related to the evaluation approach they use? And then we have another question um, from Anjali Mehta from Ethical Corp. Why does the IEA think governments are being slow to act given the many levers at their disposal? Um, so perhaps Lucas, uh, you could speak a little bit about the uh, the question about this, the paper from Science, and then Brian, perhaps on the on why aren't governments moving faster? Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Jethro, and thank you for the question. Uh, I won't go into all of the details of what the paper did and then do, but what I can say is that next to the design of policy and implementation of policy, it's important how it's implemented. So the effectiveness of a, of a policy depends on the way it's implemented and the way it's enforced on the ground. That's one. Secondly, um, we see here, and based on our analysis as well, that the most effective policy approach is an integrated approach, combining different instruments in an integrated package rather than having a single policy. Um, so uh, I think the, the most effective way where we do see effects of efficiency policies is when they're integrated in a package and they're implemented and designed and enforced well. Thanks for the question on the pace of action by governments. I don't think we would say that governments are moving slowly. Of course, we'd like to see them move faster. But as we mentioned earlier, uh, countries representing 70% of the global economy have either put in place a new policy this year or strengthened existing policies. And we certainly see that countries are responding to the COP28 commitment because they're phoning us and asking us to work with them to accelerate progress. And we have a lot of interest from governments to work with us and with each other. And of course, we are putting programs in place to work directly with governments on those issues. Ultimately, though, energy efficiency is a challenge for governments. So it, it's, it's often different to supply side energy policies, which tend to be in the power of one ministry or, or one or two ministries. Energy efficiency cuts across not just energy policy making, but also buildings, industry, transport, uh, and many other parts of government. So it is more challenging to deliver. And when we see it most successfully done, it's when governments have put in place a whole of government approach and really prioritized efficiency across all of its policy making. That leads to the most success. Thank you very much uh, for those answers. So um, there's actually a bit of a cluster of uh, questions about uh, buildings and, and, and building efficiency. So I'll, I'll try to I'll, I'll read those three. Uh, I think it's about three of them and, and see who wants to, to take them on. Um, first of all, we have what has changed in the building retrofitting market this past year, uh, especially in the EU. Um, then uh, a question on um, uh, how do we see financial institutions enabling acceleration of green mortgage financing uh, in this context? So I guess more of a financing question, but obviously building related with, with mortgage mortgages. Uh, what innovative financing product do we see as best practice in the world? And then what which policies on housing and retrofit have shown the most potential? In Scotland, we are hoping the heat and buildings bill will put hard stops on some fossil fuel use, uh, but there is little incentive to drive demand. Are we are placed place-based schemes that support switching retrofit in areas a good route from the existing evidence. Uh, um, so that's already uh, a good bunch of questions. Perhaps, um, Emma, could I ask you to take on the, the EU retrofit one? Thanks for the question. And there has been a lot of activity really in uh, building retrofitting over the last year, and especially in the EU. Um, so the EU has intensified its commitment to um, the renovation and uh, has aim to double the annual rate of renovation for residential for and non-residential by 2030. Um, however, retrofit pro projects are complex and resource intensive. And again, we need to have an approach that is the, the through policy packages to um, that has to have uh, regulation incentive and information so that people know what they can do and, and that they can implement them. Um, the initiatives that they have seek to reduce the building's energy consumption by at least 60%, um, aligning with the European Green Deal objectives. Um, so there's a, a lot happening there. I think for the next over to Lucas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma, and thank you for the question on what some of the best 
financing solutions are to scale up energy efficiency uh, investment. Um, and I think the interesting part is that this year we have a special spotlight in the market report, which you can access directly on the IEA website as well, focusing on exactly this. How can we scale up energy efficiency investments? And the, the spotlight goes into different aspects of, um, of factors that can influence uh, investment. First of all, what sectors, but also who is spending the money. And I think one of the interesting things about energy efficiency is that most of the spending uh, is coming from households, around 60% overall, 70% in buildings is coming directly from households. So then um, instruments like green mortgages and innovative finance mechanisms from uh, financial institutions are crucial to scale up this, this financing. And in the report, we provide an overview of, um, let's say, 10 different options of financing and innovative business models that might help to accelerate uh, investment in energy efficiency. So I would definitely recommend you to, to look at that list. And I think we'll be continuing this work on, on this topic as well. And then Emma, might you be able to take the one from Scotland? Firstly, I think when we look at what policies are successful, it's really important to know that there is no one size fits all. So depending on the region that you're in and the, the climate and a no, number of other factors, um, there are different policies that work. But in Scotland in particular, <laughs> there are some very good examples on heating zones where local areas are incentivized or regulated to connect to heat networks and consider other heating measures. Again, when we talk about the building sectors, we usually advocate the need for the policy package approach. So strengthening the regulation, making them up to date. When we talked about the stringency policies earlier, making sure that they are continually updated um, so that they can reflect new, new developments. Um, and making sure as well that they cover not just the new build, but as was mentioned in the EU or, um, earlier on as well, that we have the, um, for existing buildings, that we have regulation for those as well. We have new analysis that makes building energy codes comprehensive in the report, and they highlight some really, and they highlight some really good examples. And I'd advise you again to go and look at that and see what is working and what policies have been put in place and how those policies are changing to adapt to climate, to adapt to um, changing circumstances and to um, increase in their stringency and their coverage. Thank you, Emma. Um, and so now we have a, a question on uh, on behavior uh, and that's role in, in, in energy efficiency. So uh, the report also talks about uh, energy efficiency as contributed through behavioral interventions. Uh, if so, then which are the leading countries who are using behavioral interventions to promote and propagate energy efficiency? Um, and then there's also a question about uh, investment into energy efficiency, um, uh, talking about a flattening of investment into efficiency. Um, how do you view this? Is it a matter of expanding existing financing mechanisms or is a radical new approach needed for valuing efficiency? So I think, um, Lucas, you can maybe talk a little bit about the behavioral side and who are, the, who, who are setting good examples there uh, to start with. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jethro. And indeed, uh, behavior change is uh, behavioral interventions uh, can be a very uh, effective way or an important way to address energy efficiency as well. And here I might also reflect a bit on some of the other work that we're doing at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Inclusive Transitions, because over the past one and a half years, we've worked uh, closely together with different governments uh, under a project called Campaign Exchange, where we've analyzed different uh, behavioral awareness campaigns that were launched by many governments during the energy crisis or in response to the energy crisis to uh, encourage consumers to um, contribute to a reduction in, in energy demands and, and help save energy. And uh, we've done a full analysis on the different campaigns, what the differences in strategies were, what the different recommended measures were, uh, and how effective some of them might have been. Um, so some of these uh, results are reflected in the report, but I would also recommend you to, to look at some other resources from the IEA on this topic as well. Great, thanks very much. And on the financing question, is that one, anyone? Brian, Brian's gonna have a go at that one. Thank you. No, it's a very good question, of course. Investment is key for efficiency. And the nature of investment in efficiency is different in many ways to other kinds of investment in clean energy and energy as a whole. 
if only because, as, as we show in the report, the vast majority of spending is actually done by consumers uh, in terms of spending money to upgrade their home, spending money to buy a more efficient appliance, uh, those kind of investments. Um, now, of course, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of economic headwinds uh, against investment in energy generally, you know, in terms of inflation and higher interest rates, costs of capital. We've also seen disparities around the world in costs of capital, which the IEA sees as a key issue. And I think in many ways that even though efficiency investment hasn't grown, the fact that it's held steady and grown a little bit is a sign of resilience. We do hope, of course, now the changing economic climate will allow for faster investment in efficiency, which is entirely necessary um, if we are to get back on track. And as you'll see in the report, um, and as Lucas mentioned in a special spotlight on investment, efficiencies particular investment needs has led to a lot of really interesting particular kind of financial mechanisms particular types of funding models and business models that we see working well in different parts of the world and we certainly see that those innovative approaches have a lot of potential thank you brian um and then moving on to the the next question uh we have uh, a couple around, I guess, you know, the, the timing we have here, we're just ahead of uh, COP29 that's about to start. And, and we've also been talking about the COP28 doubling goal. Um, so uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, we're just at the eve of COP29. What are your key messages based on the report for COP29 and putting emphasis on the importance of efficiency uh, as the low hanging fruit? Um, and then another question, uh, what are the main problems with the gap between the 2024 progress and the doubling of energy efficiency uh, proposed by COP28. Um, so, Brian, perhaps you could speak a little bit about the, the key messages going into COP29. Um, thank you, Jethro, and thank you for the questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. COP28 was really a historic moment. We've never really seen this focus on energy in the range of, of outcomes coming from the uh, UAE consensus and this focus on energy efficiency, which, of course, we were delighted to see and an appreciation that all of these goals stand alone and deliver important benefits, but they're also interconnected. And particularly, we see that the, the, the transition away from fossil fuels and the related goals cannot happen without a strong focus on energy efficiency because it, it, it delivers early abatement opportunities, early gains. And of course, it makes other measures cheaper and more achievable by reducing the size of the energy system compared to what it might be if we were doing things less efficiently. So COP29 is about maintaining that momentum and we see really opportunities to reinforce the, the ambition. And as we say, going from ambition to action, um, particularly with the focus in COP29 on finance, as we've been discussing in earlier questions, the importance of unlocking finance for efficiency, which of course brings benefits in itself because it brings down bills, it pays for itself in terms of energy savings as well as the wider benefits. So we'd love to see that momentum maintained. And we, 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 we hope to see countries recognize, as I think they do, that now is the time for action. And again, stressing that it's not just about putting policies in place, but it matters how you implement them, how you build capacity in the markets, how you make sure you have your workforce ready, which of course is a great opportunity right around the world, how you make sure investment is flowing, and how you deliver and continue to deliver, strengthen, reinforce, and develop your policies. Thanks. And then would anyone like to speak a bit about the, the key areas for action uh, on, on doubling? If anything to... To highlight there, Lucas, maybe. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And I think, um, uh, as Brian said, we're sort of at a crucial time to accelerate progress now and looking forward to implementation. It's important for governments to think about how they can accelerate progress. Um, and we've given some of the solutions already, but I think an important first step is for governments to take stock of where they are. Um, so, for example, look at the policies that you already have in place and see where you can strengthen those. And if you don't have the policies in place yet, think about which ones you could ramp up uh, or create in the coming years. To give an example, um, some countries have building energy codes in place already, and they can think about strengthening these by making the requirements more stringent or expanding the scope by also including existing buildings rather than only new buildings, for example. But countries without building energy codes can think about setting these up as it takes some time to, to get them set up and, and, and progress needs to accelerate quickly, but also to start with energy labels and information campaigns to inform people about what's possible. So I think it's important to first start and look at where you are as a country in terms of your policy mix and from there take the steps most appropriate to you. And in the report, we give different recommendations to governments 
in different starting situations on where they can uh, accelerate the quickest in the coming years. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, a couple of questions around uh, developing economies and lower income economies um, uh, and efficiency, the role of efficiency there. Uh, one of them asks, I'm eager to know how you are working with uh, um, Central and West Africa on developing uh, strong and good energy efficiency policies uh, to, to help them on, on, on uh, energy, energy transitions. Um, and then another question, um, I'm just scrolling down more, more around uh, energy access and, and, and energy poverty. Uh, the, 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 the person highlights that energy poverty worldwide is a huge problem. Um, how is the IA looking at this? Uh, and what ex to what extent does this have an impact on overall energy efficiency uh, in relation to reducing energy demand uh, in the opinion of the IEA. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, I would start a, a quick comment from this from me uh, from a broader IEA communications perspective is, you know, the, the recent work we've done on on uh, clean cooking, um, notably in Africa, uh, including the uh, the summit we held in May um, uh, to, to kind of supercharge uh, progress on on uh, providing clean cooking asset access in Africa, which is also a key uh, uh, way of improving efficiency um, in in many uh, uh, developing economies. Uh, but I will I won't go into detail. I'll, I'll pass over to the experts. Um, perhaps Brian, you can talk a bit about what we're doing with um, uh, in Central and West Africa, and and then and then perhaps a bit about um, you know where efficiency can play an important role in improving energy access. Yeah, thank you, Jasser. Thank you for the questions. And again, as I said at the very beginning, energy efficiency is ultimately about people and helping people live better lives through more affordable, accessible and clean energy. And it applies across the world. The benefits of, of, of energy efficiency are clear to be seen in, in every region and in, in every type of country. And we see many African countries doing re really interesting work on efficiency. And we do have a special regional focus in this year's market report, which you can look at looking uh, at Africa and what's going on there. And of course, we've been delighted to be ramping up our work directly with many African countries. Just a few months ago, we ran a training course for energy efficiency policymakers in Kenya, uh, where policymakers from over 30 African countries participated. And many of you joining us will know that the IA hosts uh, an annual high level energy efficiency global conference uh, that involves a lot of ministers, CEOs and decision makers. And we were delighted that our ninth annual conference that took place just before the summer took place in Nairobi, where we were warmly welcomed by the government of Kenya. And in fact, it was our largest ever global conference on energy efficiency and really shows the, the level of interest in the region. And as Jethro said, clean cooking, which of course is about making people's lives better, particularly for women and children, is also an energy efficiency measure because it, it, it brings access, it brings affordability, uh, and of course it reduces emissions. And of course, then that connects to energy poverty, which which is is good. I'm pleased to see highlighted. We've seen rises in energy poverty in the last couple of years, driven by higher energy prices. We've seen some strong policy responses, including direct financial supports, but also tailored supports through energy efficiency, such as many European countries uh, subsidizing retrofit of building of homes and, and you know, giving higher levels of subsidies or in, in, indeed 100% subsidies for, for lower income households, which is a real fundamental structural fix for energy poverty. But it also reminds us uh, that energy efficiency is not always about reducing energy demand. It's about making energy use more efficient, improving people's quality of life. In some cases, that might lead to the same or even increased levels of energy demand for a given household, but they are much more comfortable, their home is more healthy, and they're living in better conditions. And that's exactly how we should see energy efficiency. It ultimately means there's less demand than there otherwise would be, but it's also about making people's lives better. Very good and very very well said. Thank you, Brian. Um, so there's also a question on, um, uh, I guess, um, sort of the calculation of of energy efficiency. Um, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling up through the questions because we have quite a lot. Um, one, someone is asking, how do you uh, you compute uh, calculate energy efficiency? Uh, for example, electric vehicles, their electricity may be generated by coal. Uh, should we and do you consider the whole process? Um, uh, and then I'm just seeing if there's another question that would uh, 
that would fit well with that. Um, there's also one about energy use by data centers affecting energy demand. Um, how do you see demand for energy use by data centers, data centers affecting total demand figures? Um, so perhaps, Lucas, is that you would you could take on at least the, the first part and, and perhaps the second? I'll do my best. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, if I understood the first question correctly, I think the question is about um, when switching to electric vehicles uh, in final energy that, of course, reduces energy consumption because electricity is more efficient than uh, burning fossil fuels in the car. But then the question is also, how is this electricity generated? Because if the electricity generated is still coal powered, for example, you, you have a different calculation into how efficient the, the switch to electric vehicles might be. And that's also true for, for other electric technologies, of course. Uh, the good news is that in the report, we analyze both. So we look at the change in final energy consumption when you electrify technologies, but also the change in primary energy um, consumption when you electrify. Uh, however, the important thing to uh, remember is that this depends on the electricity mix in a given country. Uh, and these differ a lot per country. So the sort of the benefits and efficiency of electrifying also vary from country to country, depending on their uh, electricity mix, mix but in the report we show that for for example switching from uh, internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles both in final terms and in primary terms uh, a lot of energy is, is saved in general um, when taking the, the global average electricity generation mix and then the second question i think you said was on data center that's right yeah so data, data center use of and demand in the growing energy demand from data centers, particularly in the light of the growth of artificial intelligence. Um, currently in uh, the EU, United States and China, energy from data centers uh, is around two to 4% of uh, total electricity demand. Um, but it's one part of the growing electricity demand. Uh, and I think um, uh, if you really wanna know more about this topic, which I think is super interesting, you should definitely stick around until exactly one month from now on the 5th and 6th of December, when the IEA is hosting a conference on energy and AI, where the, the interplay between these two things will be explored in much more detail than, than I can cover now in, uh, in a couple of seconds. Um, so keep that in your calendars for uh, about a month from now. Thanks, Lucas. And yes, indeed, uh, uh, good to flag the, the upcoming uh, energy and AI conference uh, in early December, um, where we'll be digging into some of these questions in more detail. Um, and. Uh, uh, for those who want a bit more information on the topic, there is, there is a commentary that we published uh, probably like uh, two weeks ago on the IA website, um, looking a little bit about what we know and what we don't know about uh, energy demand from data centers. So uh, it's definitely a, 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 an important and, and growing uh, topic, as Lucas said. So uh, more to come on that. Uh, I think we probably, um, we, um, I mean, a big thank you for all the questions. There's so many good ones. Um, we're not going to be able to get through all of them today uh, right now. Um, uh, but a, a couple more that are, are interesting and, and, and maybe cover some areas we haven't talked about before um, is the role of the role of governments and, and public authorities. What role do you see for public bodies, authorities, other than that of policy developer and implementer? Uh, and do you have tools to encourage them to take action? Um, also, uh, a question uh, related to the, I guess, ten, Tangentially related to that is how much are governments supporting research efforts into crucial aspects of energy efficiency? Um, are there efforts to create new materials that could speed up for home insulation or efficient air conditioners? And then, and I'm, I'm squeezing in three questions rather than two, because uh, I'm feeling generous. And the last one is um, uh, about uh, work between the um, public and private sectors uh, how could countries promote the cooperation between private and public sectors to implement energy efficiency policies? Uh, who, who would like to take which part? I'll go for the first bit on um, the role of public bodies and authorities. And really public, public bodies are vital to improving the progress on energy efficiency. They can lead the way they can, and give example and show how they are actually committing to energy efficiency themselves. Um, but and often they can act as a, a smaller version of what can be delivered at national or at regional level. So they can act as a starter for a lot of those projects. They're also essential in improving people's lives. Um, buildings, services, transport, 
in all of these sectors that the public bodies are, are inc incredibly important and um, they're, they can be really important in putting people at the centre of the clean energy transition. So working with people to actually improve their lives through energy efficiency, through the multiple benefits that we know that energy efficiency can deliver. When you look at the tools that we have, I suppose one of the things that uh, is important is the policy toolkit is, is not a static device and it also applies to public sector and to other authorities. We use it and our partners use it every day in policy development and we improve it and we, we, we strengthen it as we go along as well. And an example of where this has led to has been in things like the training week which works directly with policy makers on a one-to-one -one basis on improving their policy that can filter down to, to uh, public bodies and authorities, but also in this new initiative on the energy uh, the efficiency implementation drive, where we're working directly with policymakers. A really nice example is that the EU has given public bodies an exemplary role in their new energy efficiency directive and the uh, European Performance of Buildings Directive regulation as well. Very good, thank you. Um, Lucas, are you gonna have a go at um, uh, research and innovation? Yep. Yeah, happy to, to discuss uh, the role of innovative technologies in accelerating energy efficiency progress. But first of all, let me say that in the analysis, we see that many of the existing technologies that are commercial available today already can accelerate progress rapidly. So there is a lot of, a lot of technologies already that governments can turn to to accelerate progress. Having said that, the IEA collaborates with governments in numerous ways to scale up innovation as well. Um, for example, there are a variety of technology collaboration programs um, for different uh, topics, including one on buildings, um, where these programs bring together uh, a lot of smart people from academia, but also from other research institutions and from government that work together to exchange best practices on new innovative technologies that can help efficiency progress, in this case in buildings, but there are other ones on other technologies as well. And then we are supporting to sort of translate the innovations found there and the best practices shared there into policy-oriented messages. So governments has con have concrete tools to implement some of these things in, the, in their policy. So I think that's the way the IEA is supporting innovation in that manner. Very good, thanks, Lucas. And then Brian, uh, maybe you on, on public-private sector. Yeah, thanks, Jethro, and thanks. I think it's an important area to focus on. The, the role of the private sector is obviously crucial, as we've been emphasising, in terms of where investment happens, where innovation happens, and, of course, where action happens. And we see many companies thinking about their own energy efficiency and also thinking about their role in terms of the technologies and services they provide uh, in terms of uh, enabling efficiency right across society. And a lot of exemplary practice, a lot of really good practice of public-private collaboration. And I mentioned earlier that our most recent annual global conference on energy efficiency took place in Nairobi. And in part of that was uh, a group of businesses came together to uh, engage in dialogue with governments and the, the businesses produced the Nairobi Business Leaders Action Plan on public-private collaboration for energy efficiency. Speaking exactly to this subject, you can find that full statement on our website, looking at the opportunities about how businesses and governments can work together towards shared goals and energy efficiency, something we will continue to focus on. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm afraid that's all we have time for. It's gone on gone on uh, longer than expected. Um, and so many very good questions. I think we've covered a lot of them, uh, not quite all of them. Uh, I, I would just note for any journalists taking part, if you have any further questions, we invite you to reach out to our press office uh, and we'll get back to you. Um, and for other participants, uh, I'm speaking a little out of school here uh, as uh, head of communications, but I, I might take the liberty of encouraging you to, to reach out to your contact points in the, the efficiency team at the IEA and, and, and they can hopefully provide more information as, as needed. Um, and with that, I, it just remains for me to say thank you to, to Brian, to uh, Lucas and Emma for, for the presentation and, 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 and all the information and, and a big thank you to all of you participants uh, for the, the excellent questions uh, and, and your interest in our work. Um, as mentioned by the team, the 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 report is available uh, in full online. As is the um uh, the, the excellent data explorer. So there's a lot to, to dig into there. Um. So yeah, do please take a look. Um. And with that, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>